to introduce you to the director of Rules of Attraction, screenwriter of Pulp Fiction, director of Killing Zoe, Roger Avery. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, first, before we begin, I, I just have to say it's always funny when uh, I'm invited to come and speak with students. And I, I'm assuming everybody here is students. I was told that. Uh, who here wants to study, who here studies film or wants to study film or wants to be a filmmaker? Almost everybody. <laughs> That's cool. I always find it funny that they ask me to come and speak because my advice is always right away, drop out. <laughs> you don't need a degree to study film. Uh, <laughs> take your money and make a movie. It's the best uh, way to do it. Having said that, I, I went to college and uh, there's something about living a life separate from cinema so that you have something to cultivate into your work. And uh, I, I certainly cultivated a bit of uh, you know, my life experience going to college into, uh, into my work. And, and so th there was no value lost, I don't think. So maybe it's bad advice. Also, my daughter is here in the audience somewhere, so don't take my advice. <laughs> yeah, I worked in a video store. <laughs> So, um, just a, a show of hands, how many people have seen Rules of Traction, actually? Okay. So, the, it's an adaptation of the book by... Uh, yeah, it's Brady an adaptation Sinellis. of a, the book by Brady St. Ellis. Um, I read it, actually, when I was in college, and uh, I'd been a big fan of Brady St. Ellis, and uh, he'd only written one book, uh, Less Than Zero, but... Actually, before he had written Less Than Zero, he had written Rules of Attraction while he was in college. And I went to a small liberal arts college on the uh, west coast of the United States, very similar to Bennington, the college that Brady Stanellis went to on the east coast. And um, what can I say? It was the 80s. <laughs> there was, you know, it was uh, a small school full of, you know, a bunch of predominantly rich kids with you know nothing but time and what you saw in my film the rules of attraction and what was in the book which you know Brett wrote when he was in college was a reflection of what he was looking at and as a social satirist he just wrote it down and uh, wrote down uh, his observations on you know what he was experiencing and when I was reading the book I was like reading it I was like oh my god I, I'm like living this right now I would read a page and I would look up and I would see the characters in front of me so I thought I have to make this into a movie someday. I mean, you know, I wasn't, I'd been making movies on Super 8. Who here remembers Super 8? Um, yeah. uh, I'd been making movies on Super 8, and that was, uh, you know, I hadn't gone to film school yet. I eventually went to a school called Art Center in Pasadena with guys like Michael Bay and Tarsem. And um, eventually, after I had, like, made a film and after Pulp Fiction and after a lot of time had gone by, I found myself with a little bit of time. I was in between jobs. And uh, I just, I kept thinking about the rules of attraction, the book, and my ecstatic experiences in college. And I thought, you know, I, I, I have to exercise these demons and get them out. And so I just sat down and without owning the rights to the book, which is something I do not recommend to anybody, I adapted the uh, the book into a screenplay, and never thinking that I would get the rights to actually make it, um, I uh, I actually wrote it less like a screenplay and more like a blueprint. Uh, you know, I would again something you should never do. I would tell them, you know, I would explain camera angles and lenses that I wanted to use, and you know, the scene will require motion control, and I would describe it exactly how it would work, and then. I, the script was a crazy script. It was, you know, nonlinear, and I'd been trying to get uh, another movie made, and actually a very, you know, like, normal movies, linear films made, um, you know, studio films and things like that. And uh, and so I wrote this almost as a as a you know, as a reaction to all of that conformity that I was experiencing, and then thinking that no one would ever make it, I put it into a drawer. And I have about five scripts that I leave in the drawer. And these are scripts that I just don't, you know, commonly don't think that will get made or that uh, I'm not ready to make. And um, I met this producer, young producer, Greg Shapiro, who uh, had been trying to get another script that's in the drawer um, about the Hotel Lutetia in Paris, which was uh, during the occupation of 
Paris, uh, occupation of France, the hotel was used as a center of, um, you know, Gestapo operations, and uh, they tortured people there. And you go to the hotel now, and it's all gilded and beautiful, and it was used as a gathering place for the survivors um, afterwards. And so it, it has a really unique history. And um, so I'd written the script about the hotel management during the occupation, and I put the script into the drawer, think, thinking that it wasn't ready. And Greg found out about this, and he wanted that script. And he kept saying, I've I got to have that script. i got to have that script. And I kept saying, no, no, I'm not ready to make it yet. I'm not mature enough to make this film. It's like, this is like your fifth film or sixth film. And, uh, and so I just sat there. And so I said, I'll tell you what, you can read this one instead. And he read it. The rules of attraction it said my god what are you doing why, why are you not making this why are you just sitting on this you're an asshole and um and so he went out and i said well you know the rights and blah 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 and, and he went out and very energetically got control of the rights and then amazingly very quickly uh and i really didn't expect it because it was such a obtuse script and such oblique material um lionsgate films uh who had just had a very big success with American Psycho, asked me if I would, uh, you know, or didn't even ask me, they agreed to make the movie. And I remember giving them my budgets for the film and saying, okay, I need 10 million. Actually, it was like nine, I think it was like nine, eight, seven or something like that. I said, I, this is, I can't do it for a dime less. And they said, well, we're not gonna give you that. And because, you know, the movie was kind of a wild film. And uh, I said, well, how much will you give me? And they said, well, we'll give you four. And so I was like, oh, God, it's like an impossible task. And so I cut everything. I cut air conditioning. I cut, you know, I just stripped it down to the, the basics, just people with cameras and you know, a guy with a microphone and a tape recorder. You know, I just stripped the budget down to nothing and uh, figured out how I could make the film literally for, uh, for, for very, very, very little. And, uh, and at one point, an executive approached me and said, you know, uh, it would really help us out if uh, you could change the title of the film to American Psycho, The Rules of Attraction. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'd rather not make the movie than, um, than do that because Patrick Bateman, and who here has read the book? Anybody read the book? A few have read the book. Patrick, the character Patrick Bateman from American Psycho is the brother of Sean Bateman, and he's actually in the, the book, and he was in my movie as well. Um, I even shot those scenes and I cut them out uh, eventually and uh, just for reasons of length. Uh, the scenes are actually some of my favorite scenes in the film, but, uh, or I shouldn't say in the film, my favorite scenes on the cutting room floor or in the bin of my Final Cut Pro, <laughs> whatever it is now. And um, uh, anyhow, I, uh, um, uh, amazingly, against all odds, they allowed me to make the film and then they were making a second film at the time Andre Sekula, the uh, DP, uh, director of photography of um, Reservoir Dogs, was making his directorial debut with uh, Cube 2. And it was a very problematic production. And they were having like a disaster, thank God, and uh, for me, because I was very quietly making my movie for less money than, you know, than, you know, than it, it should have been made for. And because of that, they just kind of left me alone because I was making it for very little and for they were not gonna lose anything. They'd already, they basically told me a budget uh, that they would give me that they could, that they knew they could raise in foreign, in foreign uh, financing. And so that way, the movie was in profit before it was released. Andre's film was uh, uh, really super troubled at the time. And and uh, and so I never saw any executives or anything. They left me alone. It, it was it's an example of actually what happens when the studios and everybody just leaves someone alone to uh, to make whatever they want to make. And even in editorial, they never really asked me to. They asked me to make some changes, but they never really um, won any battles. And so it, what you see, for the most part, other than what the MPA made me cut, was uh, something that, and for reasons of length that I brought it down to, was you know exactly the movie I set out to make. And had I had the $10 million to make it, it really wouldn't have been any different. It would have just been more comfortable to make the film. <laughs> so. Um, so can you talk about the, the structure of the book and how you adapted it and changed it? Because, I mean, there's a very specific kind of narrative and storytelling style you have in the film. Uh, how how much of that reflected from the original source material? Well, anybody who's read the book knows that uh, it's written in kind of a non-linear style. 
it has a very, um, uh, and, and, and Brett writes in a very cinematic fashion. Um, there's unreliable narrators. And there, there must be 15, 20 narrators in the book. And everybody is unreliable. They say one thing in one chapter and another thing in another. And, every, and points of view are constantly conflicting. And, um, and in many ways, it's, if it's possible, a nonlinear book. It's a very, um, uh, it's a very fragmented um, style of storytelling. And yet, highly cinematic. And so the trick was to maintain the ethic and the, um, you know, the, the spirit of the novel without, uh, I mean, because I made massive, massive changes. And anybody who's read the book knows that you can make maybe 50 movies, a thousand movies out of that material. And in, uh, in adapting it, I wanted to, um, Maybe it's because, for whatever reason, I'm the kind of person who uh, I'm not really good at just making widgets and just you know cranking the handle at the sausage factory and you know <laughs> making. Uh, I just I, I'm not wired that way, and so um, I, I don't know. It's <laughs> how, how can I describe this? I, for me, it's important that you that you cultivate in your life into your work and that you make something that kind of reflects who you are as a person and, um, uh, you know, and is, uh, th that embarrasses you when you screen it because it's all of your good sides and all of your bad sides. And so what I did was I took bits of my life and what I had seen and I folded it into Brett's work and what he had done and this, uh, and, and so it's a very, um, it's, it's not an exact, I wouldn't call it a, even a close adaptation. When I, um, when I finished making the movie, it's very different from the book. There's an abortion in the book. Um, you know, the Lauren character is much more promiscuous and it's not about the loss of her virginity. It's, uh, you know, it's in many ways very different, but thematically it's identical. And I, after making the film, I was really nervous about Brett because he's very vocal. He had been, at that point, very vocal, um, a, a very strong and harsh critic on the films and the filmmakers who had adapted his work. And um, while I got along very well with Brett, I was really nervous about what he would think. And I remember one day at an early screening, the lights came up at a, just at a test screening, and I saw that Brett was in the audience, and I completely freaked out. I was like, oh my God, he's gonna, he's gonna attack me. And he came up and said he, he hugged me and he said, "Oh my God, you've done it! You've you've made something that's absolutely true to my work. You you adapted it perfectly." And I said, "But Brett, I I made so many changes. I mean, it's it's so different from uh, you know from the story of your book." And he said, "Yeah, but you stayed true to what mattered, which was the spirit of the novel and um, and the ethic of it. And you know, so because of that, and I've since adapted a number of Brett's." Um, uh, Brett's books. I own the rights to the Glamorama, and I've adapted that, and I'm attached right now to direct Lunar Park, which is another Brett Easton Ellis novel. I don't know, I'm becoming like the Brett Easton Ellis guy, I guess. It's like being a biographer or something. I don't know. So, I don't know. That was sort of how I, um, I adapted it. I just kind of... Um, I, uh, has anybody here heard me already tell the Stanley Kubrick story? Or, yeah, you, okay, since so there were some people there last this night. This is a good one. <laughs> I was working with John Milius, and um, on a uh, we were working on a, on a on a TV series actually that never came to pass, and uh, and so I got to know John Milius. And who here knows who John Milius is? Anybody? He's like John Milius is like the gun guy in Hollywood. He's uh, he he wrote Apocalypse Now. He uh, he knows everything about war and about guns, and he's like the biggest gun aficionado. He's the guy that you go to to, uh, you know, when you want to talk about war, or guns, and in fact, the series we're working on was about Medal of Honor winners. And, um, and so I got to know John a little, and he told me this story. This was right before I, uh, I did Rules of Attraction. And so maybe it had an effect on how I adapted the material. But he said one day Stanley Kubrick called him up on the telephone. And he said, I understand you're the gun guy. And he said, right, ah, I'm the gun guy. And uh, he said, so um, I'm looking for the best handgun that has ever been manufactured. 
I'm, uh, I want, I'm collecting guns right now and I'm looking for a, you know, a handgun. I want the very best one for target shooting. And he said, oh, well, that would be a Colt 45 Special manufactured 1942 to 1944. Very difficult to find. They're very rare weapons, um, but a very fine, fine gun. And Kubrick said, well, that's the one I want then. I have one requirement. The gun must have never been fired. And so Milia said, well... <laughs> That's a tall order, but let me see what I can do. And he looked around, and lo and behold, he found in Texas, of course, a collector who, uh, who had such a gun. And he called up Kubrick, and he said, you're not going to believe this. I found the gun. Not only has it never been fired, it's never been taken out of its original box. It's mint condition. It's perfect. It's a perfect gun. It's new. And so Kubrick said, fantastic, but it's not cheap. And so Kubrick said, money is no object. Money comes from England. It goes to Texas. And the gun goes from Texas to England. And a couple months go by. And Milius finds himself on the phone again with Kubrick. And he uh, says, how do you like the gun? And Kubrick says, I love it. I love it. I shaved a quarter of a millimeter off of the barrel and uh, realigned the bead and swapped out the hammers for uh, titanium, switched out the trigger and as well as the tumbler mechanism and took off the mother of pearl and put on mahogany. I elongated this, I shortened that. And Milius is mortified. He's like, oh my God, what have you done? You've ruined it. And Kubrick says, no, I made it better. <laughs> and I always thought that's how you have to approach adapting material, <laughs> that you have to be willing to completely take something that may be perfect already as it is and to completely disassemble it and then be willing to reassemble it and recreate it into something that hopefully is better. Um, or at least something that's appropriate for the medium because the experience of watching a film is very different than the experience of watching a book. It's not me. It's you. Yeah. <laughs> so on, on, that, uh, on that note, why don't we watch a clip and then we'll discuss it. Uh, so the first clip will be uh, Sean and Lauren meeting in the hall, which is their first uh, meeting after they... Right. The, in fact, when I was describing writing the script um, kind of uh, blueprint style, this was one of those scenes where I had seen it in my head how to do this, and I had, I had thought about how to... Um, uh, you know, how to use usually motion control is when you use a motion control camera, you set up a track and you know, the entire the motion control, which was developed by um, Dykstra um, for doing Star Wars, was so you could do multiple identical passes um, and you program the camera to do a multiple pass. And that way you can, using your number of plates, ultimately composite them together. And commonly motion control is uh, uh, on an identical path. And I started thinking about it and I was like, well, what if motion control was used with divergent paths? where you started on two different points and ended up at a common point. So you have uh, two separate starting points and a, you know, a singular finishing point. Um, and so I thought, I, I just started, and so I wrote down the exact materials that I would need and everything. And even though it had been written into the script, maybe I, because I wrote it too technically, a lot of the people on the crew had no idea what we were doing until, and we were watching it on the monitors, you know, with the motion control guys and after the shot kind of, after we finally got the second part of the plate, um, I could hear everyone in the crew go, oh, <laughs> like, and kind of understand it. And, um, uh, and I'll explain how, we, you know, in more detail how we did it after, maybe after we show it. This clip I, I think is just on, uh, it's just digital video projected, so. So it's just uh, uh, Sean and Lauren have gone to uh, attend a tutorial on a Saturday morning uh, and it's been canceled and then they meet in the hallway. So, um, I had always been a big fan of Douglas Sirk, the filmmaker of um, like All That Heaven Allows and a number of films. And Sirk, uh, unlike many filmmakers today, used the cinematic grammar and uh, you know spoke a kind of cinematic language where when you watch Sirk's films, uh, there's more than going on than just the... Um, than just the performances. He used the language of the camera to, uh, to enhance the performances. And so if two people are separated um, you know, emotionally or uh, by their opinions, he would physically separate them. Like for instance, if Colin and I were having an argument, he would have Colin in one shot and then me in another, 
and not until we had come to an accord would he unite them into the single frame, and thus connecting them, you know, in uh, in a single shot. And Cirque believed that uh, there was kind of a, a language to cinema that works on a subconscious level. Um, he would also use uh, he would have people stand in doorways and swaths of color, you know, to uh, to represent uh, you know th their emotions and and it, and I believe it all works on a subconscious level. And so I had been thinking about Douglas Cirque and how to take two people who were um, uh, disconnected and to kind of reunite them. And that was sort of the um, why I did why the scene kind of came into my head to to shoot it this way. Um, it was just sort of, uh, well, why, what if you, know, you had two people on the same screen at the same time talking to each other and then were able to, at a very specific moment, connect them um, visually in a, in a sort of neo circian style. And um, it was funny because after I showed the movie to Christophe Gans, who's a French director, who's a friend of mine, he, uh, he was like, oh, you've, you've done it. You've invented something new. You know, it's, it's so rare. It's so nice to you know, have uh, a, a new invention in cinema. But there may be, you never know, there may be a film in India or you know, Azerbaijan where someone has done this in the 50s. <laughs> it's like you said, that's the wonderful thing about cinema is you think you've invented something and maybe you haven't. So, <laughs> um, so the, when you've got the two characters there, when they meet at the end, you've got that poster right in the middle, which has also got the two faces. Right. Where do you fit in? Yeah. 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 Uh, it, it was just, uh, I mean, the, the way the scene was shot was, um, okay, so if this is James Vanderbeek and this is Shannon Sossaman, um, some people commented there's actually too much space between them, and there is. It's, it's a flaw. But that's because there had to be a camera in between them. And so we had the camera like this, and then it would kind of, well, I should say the camera like this, shooting uh, one plate. And we started on Shannon because um, when you work with actors, you kind of learn people's rhythms. And some people get better and better and better and better the more takes they do. Some people, uh, they burn out very quickly. And Shannon was a, um, she's not a formally trained actor. Um, she's more of a, a, just a natural spirit and you just catch her. And I learned very quickly that she, she would actually burn out after about three takes. She, she would bring something kind of magic to a moment and then get become lost and confused, and uh, at least in those days. And, um, and so I started on her side. And I, in fact, I always started with Shannon because, uh, because of this. James and Jessica Biel and Ian and all, most of the other actors, having worked in television, were always really prepared. They would show up on uh, on set. They knew their lines. They uh, they knew how to move within the frame and how to find their light. They were extremely professional. Except in television, you know, you tend to get three takes maybe, and then moving on. And uh, and so um, they just weren't used to having more takes to fine tune their performance. And so I would begin on Shannon, and then always move on to whoever afterwards because. By the time Shannon was burning out, they were just warming up, and they would just get better and better and better. And so I began on Shannon's side. We shot her plate, and then the camera moved back to uh, the two shot. And James actually wasn't in the shot; he was, uh, um, you know, delivering lines off camera. But you know, we pulled back to the clean plate, and then we came and we did his side, and we using the pre the pre we kind of pre selected a, a certain take, and then did playback that he uh, performed off of. And you know, then shot his plate, and we shot multiple plates, and then just chose the uh, the best take for it. It's a little strange because his head is so big, and her head is like so tiny and round, and so it's kind of <laughs> so. Anyhow, <laughs> no, their heads are actually that big. Yeah, or his head is that big. <laughs> He's like this, you know. Historically large head. <laughs> can, you, can you actually talk about the the casting? Um, because I mean, he was like hot off of Dawson Creek, which um, I mean, to put him in a film which had such kind of very raw content. Uh, I mean, what was your decision on that? Was he your first decision or, or first choice? Uh, you know, um, whenever you're casting a film. It's there's really you always have like uh, who you'd like to be in it, and it's very rare that when I did Killing Zoe, my first film, I wrote it thinking about Eric Stoltz. I was like, I want Eric Stoltz to to be in this, 
and amazingly, I got Eric Stoltz. And so that was kind of a rare instance. In this case, I uh, at a certain point, I started floating the idea of James Vanderbeek, and I wasn't even really thinking consciously of bringing in all these kind of young TV actors and completely perverting them. Uh, I was more, um, and actually, I wasn't even sure about James, but and and I was meeting also with uh, James Franco, and um, there were a number of young actors at the time who wanted to be in the film, and most people at the, and in fact, at the studio, they really at first didn't want James um, to be in the film. And I went and I met with him uh, to have lunch and you know started talking and he took off his glasses and I looked into his eyes and he had these kind of, I don't know how to say it, but this kind of vacant, empty, shark-like eyes. <laughs> and I looked at him and I was like, oh my God, you're perfect for it because everybody else was too on the nose. Like, And I love James Franco and he's a friend of mine, but um, he... Uh, he was almost too much like the Bateman in the book, and I wanted somebody who was um, who had kind of an innate charisma to him, and um, and so uh, I, I fought really hard for James, and um, you know, and fortunately got him, and I think it was a really lucky. I mean, it's another thing. Uh, I'll tell you a little story actually about Killing Zoe. When uh, when I was making the film, uh, I, I had no money. Nothing. I was completely broke, and um, I, I had uh, there was a, a couple of Canadian producers who were making like ten movies in a row. They were just, they were just cranking out you know product, and uh, I went to them, and because I'm Canadian, and because um, uh, I, I I just I had written this movie. I was trying to get the money. I had gone all through L.A. Almost nobody would make it. He's like, "Okay, you're Canadian. We'll make the movie." We just had a film fallout, and uh, and so we can slot you in. You'll be film number six. And they were just going to use the same crew and just cranking through it. And uh, and we can slot you in. And so I was like, "Okay, this, I've never been closer to making a movie." And um, and so th I just needed some foreign sales. To, uh, to do it. And so I, I flew to Can the Cannes Festival and I had no money. And uh, Monty Hellman, the director, let me sleep on his floor. And uh, and he was like living outside of Cannes. And so it was like this huge walk. And I would eat like hors d'oeuvres at parties because I couldn't afford to eat. And so I'd go to parties and I would like just be hounding down, <coughs> you know, like hors d'oeuvres and uh, doing foreign sales. And all the people in LA who had turned me down and said no to the film, suddenly they kind of saw me there and they're like, it's that. It's a kid, and he's uh, he's here. His film must be real, and so <laughs> and so they uh, a little bit of interest started, and I ended up meeting with Samuel Hadida, who's uh, who I'd worked with before on on True Romance, and he um, Sammy said, "Oh yeah, you know, we never actually met, but he's like, oh, he's French, he's a funny guy, and he's like, oh yeah, uh, uh, we uh, we worked together once, and you know, this movie it's got French con content, and I'll I'll buy France as a territory, France and Benelux, which is the Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg territories. And so I'll buy those territories, and if you like, on your after Cannes, you can go to France, go to Paris." And I'll introduce you to some actors, and because I had a list of actors like Irene Jacob and you know Julie Delpy and people like that that I wanted to uh, meet with, and he said, "Come and uh, uh, come to Paris afterwards." And I was like, "Okay, great." And so I go to Paris because my ticket took me that way. Anyways, and I checked into a room that I couldn't pay for, and th this is the days before the internet, and so you know this, you know where they would like swipe your card. And I was just hoping that I could get these Canadian producers to uh, you know to pay for my room, and um, and so I go and I, I check into this kind of cheap divey hotel, and then Sammy sets up a couple of meetings, and one of them was with a Jacob, and he set him up in this like super fancy, expensive French restaurant that I couldn't have paid for, and I go in and I'm sitting with a Ren, and she was like, oh, I'd, you know, I'd, I I love your uh, I love your script, and I'd love to work with you, but you know I'm. Christoph Kislovsky is my boyfriend, and he ha he's making a movie with me, and I'm waiting for him to get the money together, and I have to wait for him. And I was like, oh. And so, and so, I, and so I just tried to keep lunch going as long as possible talking until Sammy showed up and paid the bill because I couldn't pay the bill. And so uh, my next meeting was with Jean-Hugues Anglade, the French um, actor who I eventually cast in the film. 
And he comes in, he was coming off of La Femme Nikita and, I don't know, Betty Blue and, uh, um, you know, he was a big French star. And so I meet with him and his manager comes and they're like, oh, we love this script so much. We just want to know, how, how do we convince you that John Hugh would be good for this? And I was thinking, oh my God, this is like exactly what you want to hear. And I'm like, well, we can talk about it. And so I, um, you know, I, I, I talk with him and I immediately think, oh my God, this is a, a connection. This guy was the character for my film. I mean, he was the guy. And so I immediately go back to my hotel room and I call the, the Canadian producers, um, the Vancouver producers, and I tell them about the, uh, the the casting coup that I've just pulled off. And I'm like, this is it. I've got John Hugh Gunglade. And they're like, who? <laughs> like, John Hugh Gunglade, he's a big French actor. They're like, ah, ah. And it, it, we'll tell you who you can cast. Um, it's, uh, it's not you who tells us. We'll tell you who to cast. I said, no, but you don't understand. This guy's a big French star. And he's like, no, no, you're going to need a Canadian. I said, yeah, but I count as two points uh, because a writer-director will get like, you know, Kiefer Sutherland or Keanu Reeves or you know, some, a Canadian actor and, uh, and we'll be set and we can cast anybody else. And they said, no, no, no. And we got into this argument because I knew that this was right. And I, I mean, I, I, I felt it. And when you feel it, you have to go with it because your mind will lie to you, but your heart will never lie to you. Your heart will always tell you the truth. And so I, uh, you know, I, I got into a little bit of an argument with them and they said, look, kid, you can either make the movie or not make the movie, but we'll tell you what you can and can't do. And if you don't want to make the movie, just hang up the phone. And I sat there for a minute and I had never been closer to getting a movie made in my life and I was dead broke and I hung up the phone. And, um, and I thought, okay, what am I gonna do now? I was like on the fourth floor of this hotel. I thought I could throw my luggage out and then I could <laughs> sneak out and hitchhike to the airport. You know, it was like, a, you know, and instead I went and I just glued myself to Samuel Hadida because now I had Jean Hugo and Glaude and I just went and, you know, Hedido had already agreed to buy France and now I had a big French star in the film and so I just thought, okay, that's my asset. And so I went and I found Sammy and I just glued myself to him for about 48 hours. I just kept talking to him and explaining to him what the movie would be and I kept telling him, oh, it's going to be, it's like a sexy thriller. It's a sexy thriller. I never once told him I was planning on making, you know, like uh, that the sex would have like a Nosferatu scene in it and that the... You know, that it was really more like an existential, uh, you know, art house film. But, you know, that, that was, uh, um, you know, and, and just talked him into it. And I guess the moral, if there is one, is that when you feel it's right, you have to be willing to walk away from the table for what you believe, no matter how much you want what's on the table. If, if you're not going to have control, you have to be willing to walk away. Um, it's uh, otherwise people will walk all over you constantly and um, it, so you have to be willing to collapse your own film as a, as, as a result because and, and just believe that you'll be able to set it up because the only way films come together is through the sheer force of mighty willpower it's not money it's not you know actors it's not this or that it's one person saying i am going to do this with or without you if you want to go do it with me great we can come and go make a movie together but i'm going to make it with or without you and invariably the person sitting across the uh, table from you will say hmm he's going to make it with or without me I, maybe i should be part of this you know it, it's almost like you have to make them want you i guess and so that was uh, so fight for what you believe. So we'll go on to another clip. Um, so I guess clip number two here will do the um, the clip between. Yeah, that's a Paul weird clip. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what do you want to show? What no, I mean want? we can show clip two. Yeah. I, I just don't know why we're showing clip two, but we can show clip two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, the character Paul has has a crush on Sean. Uh, Sean doesn't quite know or really kind of understand it and well, you, or or Sean also may be mm -hmm. schizophrenic and uh, I mean the whole thing about the book <laughs> was that you have uh, you have a you know in one chapter you have a character describing oh and I met Sean Bateman and uh, we went to my dorm room and we got high and then we made out and you know I, I love him and and then you cut to the next chapter and it's Sean's description it's like yeah I went to the room and 
this guy was weird and you know but I, but he had free pot and so I smoked the pot and you know then I, then I left and it's like he's completely and you don't ever really know who to believe because everybody is in conflict with everybody else and so um, I, I just wanted to maintain that in the film and there's so many I decided to, to design the film uh, has anybody here seen Le Regle du Jeu the French film uh, Rules of the Game by Jean Renoir that was my inspiration for making this film originally was that um, Renoir made this movie Rules of the Game and I always believed that Brett had read the book and kind of uh, studied or, I'm sorry had seen the movie and uh, had kind of made his version of it and Renoir's film is about a kind of class of people dancing on the edge of a volcano you know sort of uh, with this enduring, luxurious debauchery, thinking that the party will never end, when in fact fascism is pounding at the door, and uh, Europe is about to collapse as a result of the, uh, um, you know, the sort of debauchery that's taking place. And Renoir's film, when he made it, was uh, he, he sold it and he made it as a comedy, and he had made a number of comedies beforehand. And uh, when audiences went and saw the film. It, it, it was much more of a, a of a satire. I mean, in those days, champagne comedies were uh, you know where people run in and out of doors and kind of comedies of error. You know, that was it was big in those days. And so he he made that film, and people thought, oh, that's the kind of movie we're going to go see, and they would go see it, and people were freaking. They were, I mean, in those days, people really got passionate about movies. Like when they got upset about a movie, they would throw ink blotters at the screen and they would rip up the seats from the theater and riot in the streets. And the panicked distributor was like, my God, what's going on? People hate the movie. And so they kept trying to cut the film. They kept cutting the movie and cutting the movie and cutting, making it shorter and shorter and shorter, which only made people matter and matter and matter. And uh, eventually the film you know, had had been cut so much, and then it was like lost to the ages for a number of uh, for a number of years until somebody found it, and ironically, in a in a German vault uh, where it had been banned in Germany, and so they put the all the banned movies because the Germans loved to categorize things, and <laughs> and they uh, put it in a vault, and that's so ironically, the Nazi Party saved this movie that was in some ways a criticism of the rise of fascism. Anyhow, Renoir's style. Uh, was very economic, um, and maybe it's just because of the size of the cameras in those days, and uh, you, know, you know the the restrictions of uh, of shooting in those days. But his style was very simple. He shot everything in a very simple um, manner. Usually, uh, maybe uh, maybe just two angles in a scene. You know, he might just kind of move in on one person and then have a two shot and so I decided to adopt a Renoir style while making this film even though and though the movie had been criticized on release as being a very um, uh, kind of like MTV style film which I don't see at all uh, it uh, it's actually shot in a very simple straightforward way I mean everything is very um, you know I, I tend to anyhow I compose the movie largely in close-ups the almost the entire film is close-ups and then with internal monologues and so um, I don't know why I said that in introducing this odd clip but <laughs> here, here it is <laughs> thank you I think I mean that that clip the the interesting thing about the clip is the whole kind of like very kind of iconic setup of like the back of the bus you see like the the kind of I mean it's yeah, you know how hard it, you know how hard it is to find a bus that has a window in the back these days. <laughs> uh, that was actually the most. I was like, oh, I need a bus, and I need to have a window in the back. And they're like, okay, and they went and started searching for one, and it was like uh, they don't really use buses like that anymore. And so I had to like round up a bunch of old, old, old buses for it. So yeah, um, but but you take that kind of like that classic kind of departure scene and kind of flip it around because I mean, Sean's not thinking at all what we would expect him to be thinking. He's thinking about basically what the next fuck is, what the next conquest is, what his next meal is. Nothing to have to do with the, the situation really. Which was kind of the idea of the film is that you know you don't ever really know what's inside of someone else's head, only you know what's inside of your own head. And um, reality is based on observation and, and really choice. You know, we choose what we observe. We see the world, most of us see the world through two eyes. And we, th 
through convergence, fold those two separate images together into one, uh, you know, one image. And um, when in reality we're seeing two, two eyes that see two actually different things. And maybe I can indulge everybody here for a moment. Uh, see the dot on the, on the tiff? Everybody make an okay sign and then with both eyes open, center your, uh, the, uh, the okay sign on the dot. And, and hold, hold your hand a little bit away from your face, just, uh, and, and just with both eyes open, look at the dot. Then shut one eye and shut the other. What you'll notice is that only one eye has the dot centered, and that's the dominant, the opposite side of your brain from your eye is the dominant side of your brain, and everybody here has a different dominant side of your brain. And so um, what's happening is that you're seeing two separate things, and, you're, and your brain is telling you something else. Um, people are like that also. People see things differently, and we um, understand uh, what we see differently. And the, uh, when I read the book, that, that was the primary theme that kind of percolated to the surface for me was that, um, you know, how in a movie do you relay the, this idea of um, all these kind of convergent points of view into, uh, um, you know, in, in, into uh, something, that, some sort of coherent statement. And so, uh, and that was, I, I, at the time when I made this film, I was very much, uh, I mean, I was thinking a lot about the nature of reality and, and the nature of observation and how the act of observation affects what you view and how really what we view is, um, you know, is, is purely by choice. And that insane people who see pigs that fly are, I mean, if it's real enough for them, then it's real enough for me. <laughs> you know, if, if belief is belief. And, uh, and, and so especially in relationships, when uh, I, I just wanted to get the, these ideas across that had been, you know, that I'd been thinking about. So that was one of them, I guess, that scene. So if we're gonna go to the next scene um, that we have queued up here, and this is, uh, basically a good way to talk about your use of music in films. And <clears throat> watching Rules of Attraction is every song there kind of pops out of like kind of a memory for me of the time. I'm like, oh, like the, the, the Cure song. And um, when you were, how often do you go into these things with set music in your mind? Or I, how do you use that to form this it? this script in particular, I actually wrote the, uh, uh, the songs into the script because, um, and, and amazingly, most of the songs. Um, you know, let me just see which other clips we're showing just so I can... I've got the Faith clip. Yeah, the Faith clip. Is, uh, is that the one that's next? Yeah. Um, this one actually was one song that wasn't in the, uh, you know, that wasn't in, and, and maybe this is actually a good uh, thing to talk about a little bit. Um, Almost all the songs in the film, I, I was taking lyrics and uh, making sure that the song wasn't just a, a cool song, but had lyrics in it that kind of would comment on what somebody was feeling or going through. And um, this was one day where we were shooting the hotel scene with uh, um, where Paul goes away and he's at this hotel, he's at the Ritz-Carlton or something. And um, his friend from, uh, you know, who goes to another college shows up and their mothers are friends and they've had kind of a relationship together. And so I, I shot the scenes and we kind of finished up early that day. And when I was done, I was like, God, you know, it's like we're early. We've got like, you know, 45 minutes to, with nothing to do. I've got a camera and I've got people and I could do more, more, you know, more takes, but maybe I'll just do something fun to just watch during dailies tomorrow. And um, and so I just I planned I looked at the the guy um, who plays uh, Richard, who plays Dick, uh, the actor Russell Sams, and uh, I was looking at him and he was he had these kind of aviator glasses on and like a leather jacket. And I was like, you look like George Michael. Somebody go get a CD and I had a CD in my car of George Michael's Faith album. And I was like, go go down and get that CD and pop it on and. Here's what we're gonna do. This is your first day shooting a movie. This is his first film. 
It's your first day shooting a film, and uh, we're going to do a little hazing. You know, it's like a little uh, initiation. Uh, we're just going to have you dance on the bed and do a striptease for the crew. <laughs> and he had never done a movie, so he's like, uh, okay. And I was like, and, and you're going to do it to George Michael's faith. And, <laughs> and so I set up the camera, just one angle, and uh, I just I, I cranked the music, and I flipped the camera on, and I just said, okay, go. And he just started dancing completely unchoreographed and unplanned and just something that I thought we could just, you know, I like, I like the crew to be able to watch dailies because I want them to know what they're making also. I, you know, it's like no one person makes a movie. It's like, you know, 75 to a hundred people that are making that film. And it's, I find that it's best. And in the old days when we would screen dailies in, uh, you know, in a, in an actual theater, a day or two after we'd shot it, I would always invite the entire crew to come, whoever wanted to, whoever wasn't exhausted, and uh, we'd order pizzas and we'd sit around and just watch dailies. And so in this case, we, you know, we would watch them all during lunch on a big monitor that I would set up. And, uh, and I just always liked to have something fun and we were constantly shooting. I mean, I shot so much film that we didn't ever use. And so I thought, oh, this will just be something fun to show to the crew. And so I put it on and it starts up and everybody's laughing and he's dancing and it was really fun. And then er Ian Summerhalder, I see him walking by the hall and he had been in wardrobe uh, or he had been in getting, he was getting out of makeup or something and he was walking by because he had finished shooting and he looked in and he's like, what the hell is going on in there? And he was just wearing a, like a bathrobe with his underwear on underneath. And I saw Ian and I was like, get in, <laughs> get in. And so he just jumped in and they just kind of danced and, and it was really like just kind of something fun. And then afterwards, I was like, oh my God, this is so good. I have to use it. I, I've, I've got to like get the, but the, to buy Faith, the song was our entire music budget. <laughs> it was like impossible to get. And so I wrote George Michael a letter and I included the scene of just the, the Faith song and I sent it to him asking him if I could, uh, you know, if, if he could bring the price down. And I will always thank George Michael. God bless you, George Michael, because he's a cool guy. He said, you can have the song for free. And um, gave me the song to use in the movie. And uh, that's the scene that, uh, um, and so anyhow, I, I cut it here. And I was actually thinking about this the other day. I, I Originally, I had like an entire take of the entire song. And it was a little long, but I loved it. I just wanted to keep it. But the studio was like, hey, you should really trim that down a little bit. It's it's a little long. It's a little indulgent. And so I intercut into it. But uh, I was actually thinking about it the other day, and I should pull out the my old drives and maybe put it online or something on YouTube or something like that. Because since then, I've noticed, and it's if there's anything I've done in my life that's good, I think this is, the, this is it. Because... Um, <laughs> Well, and my daughter, who's here in the audience. <laughs> but um, if there's anything that I've done that I'm that I'm really proud of, it's the fact that on YouTube, there's like you know a, a bunch of people who, for fun, go out and they do the George Michael dance on their bed. And I don't know, it's like a celebration of joy of life to me. And um, last night after we did the screening of the film, I just did kind of a search on Twitter to see if there was anyone who was tweeting of seeing the screening. And you like within like five hours, previous five hours, there are like around four different tweets of people referencing the uh, the dance number from. Yeah, like, and if, it, it's just yeah. And if you look it up online, there's a bunch of people who just uh, you know. A couple of girls will just let their video camera roll and dance on the bed to George Michael. And it's like, you know what? I feel if I've contributed to anything to the world, that's what I'm the most proud of. So, All right. <laughs> you know, um, I'm, I'm not gay, but I love watching guys dancing on a bed. I don't know, I don't know what that says. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it was funny because I was just, as I was watching this just now, I was thinking um, about when we test screened the film. And, uh, you know, Lionsgate set up like a test screening in like Orange County or something, which is a very conservative uh, county in, you know, in California at like a mall. And they invited, you know, like mall kids to come in. And Lionsgate's idea was, oh, we're making a teen comedy. And my idea was I'm making, you know, like the assassination of teen comedies. And um, 
I, I was doing what Renoir did, you know, like, with the champagne comedies. You know, he ended up making something that like was, you know, disturbing people instead. And so I remember when this scene played, we had the most walkouts. Like people got up and they started yelling. They're like, fag film! And, you know, <laughs> just, you know, walking out. And the comment cards were like, you know, fag film! You know, and it was just like, oh my God, you know, it's, uh, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I, watching, if you can't enjoy that, you know. <laughs> I've been watching the film last night. There's a lot of stuff in it which, at the time, was still risque, which is now much more common oh, in on TV. It's even. tame by comparison. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's this movie is actually very tame, and even at the time, there was nothing in this film that hadn't been in other movies before. I mean, I was I was very careful to make sure that it was just the. Um, the tone of the film was different, and uh, um, you know, I uh, the, the there was a suicide scene in the in in the film, and it I, I received the most mail that I've ever received on anything else about that scene. People who were both upset, but also people who were really thankful. People who were like, you know, I was in the theater, and you know, in uh, you know, some kind of mini mall, uh, not mini mall, uh, what do you call it? Uh, multiplex. Uh, yeah, multiplex cinema. They went to see the movie thinking that they were going to go see, you know, like a teen comedy, a date film or something. And suddenly we're trapped in a theater watching like the suicide sequence, you know, kind of unfold. And they were like, wait a minute, this is, this is wrong. <laughs> and then there, you know, the people who were really, uh, it just wasn't what they expected, and it, it wasn't really helped by the fact that Lionsgate uh, sold the film almost entirely as a teen comedy. I mean, they really pushed it like, this is a teen comedy. And then they opened it wide, which was baffling to me at the time. They, uh, they opened it on, I, I think, I mean, wide at the time for Lionsgate, which was like 1,200 screens, which is a you know, huge release. And I had kind of always thought, oh, that we'll do like uh, you know, 50 screens, we'll hit the college towns, we'll build word of mouth. That was like the smart way to do it. They instead, you know, just sprayed it all over the place, freaked everybody out, took the money and ran. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. Um, so actually, let's we'll we'll set up for the next clip, then we'll go to a, to do a Q and A with the audience. Uh, the next clip is uh, when Sean goes to buy drugs, taking kind of an unwilling partner into this situation. And this kind of talks and harkens back to your other work where when there is violence, it's kind of crafted around dialogue, tension, panic. Um, can you talk about that? And, and comedy. I yeah. mean, oh, yes. you know, uh, I mean, you, you, it was funny. I, not too long ago, I showed my daughter The Tenant, the Roman Polanski film. Has anybody here seen it? Okay, a few people. Anytime you move into a new apartment, watch that film. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I love The Tenant. And to me, it's a comedy. And so I remember I showed my daughter The Tenant. I'm like, oh, this is a great Polanski comedy. And she's like, this is not a comedy. This is like a series of very uncomfortable moments <laughs> just put on film. And um, yeah, and so this scene where he goes and he visits this guy, Rupert, um, you, you know, I, I cast Clifton Collins and... We, we started doing rehearsals in the scene and I was like, I took Clifton aside and I said, Clifton, uh, do you know that you're doing the Samuel Jackson voice? He's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you like it? <laughs> I'm like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I do. I just wanted to make sure you knew <laughs> that you were doing it. And, um, you know, he, uh, this guy, Rupert, it, he's kind of meant to be sort of a, you know, kind of an over the top coked out kind of, uh, um, unhinged guy and to me the the best thing to do is to always have kind of moments of release and and, and to just pl play it for comedy and so that was sort of the idea with this and um and and maybe it was just my own you know after pulp fiction and the success that you know we both had from it and uh what people always expected from me it was sort of like okay i know you expect this and i'll, I'll give you this and i'll give it to you with as many you know motherfucking motherfuckers as i can and so that's this scene. So. Thank you. I would have been the Mitchell guy in college. I'm ah! like screaming like a, <laughs> just screaming. <laughs> so I mean the, the, 
the scene is actually there is not much violence in it. It's it's more you don't see anything, but the whole tension and energy of the screen kind of catapults you to thinking you've seen it or reacting that you've seen it. I find. Yeah, and in fact, as I was watching this, I was just thinking this is the scene I shot the most coverage on um, because I shot like every single piece, and much of it was handheld, um, and so uh, you know it was just about. Um, kind of assembling all of you know, these little pieces and um, you know and just playing Rupert for who he is which is kind of this uh, you know sort of just out of control guy and I've met guys actually like Rupert they don't all talk like Samuel Jackson but they <laughs> but they're kind of like uh, they're, I've met a lot of guys like <laughs> do we, on that note do we have any questions yeah Let's maybe see. it's a good time to yeah <laughs> Yes. No, you can. Uh, you can ask about anything. Yeah. Is it just rules of attraction uh, questions that you're taking, or just no, no? You can general? ask any question. Okay. Well, personally, like I'm a really big fan of Silent Hill. Yeah. Like I really like it a lot. Were you ever approached to direct it or even write the sequel to it? No. In fact, what happened was uh, Christoph Gans and I are are really good friends, and um, he just they had. They called me out. He and Samuel Hadida, who produced my first film and uh, was a producer on this film as well, uh, they called me up and they were like, "Oh, we have a script and it's it's in French, and um, but we need like uh, an English adaptation and we kind of need you to work on the dialogue a little." And it's like, "Yeah, I can do that." And they were like, "And we can't afford to pay you anything. You know, we'll pay you like your rewrite fee or something like that." And uh, I was like, oh, "That's cool." And so, but we'll you know you can come to France and you can stay in Paris for a while. And I was like, "Great!" And so I go to Paris and I show up and there's no script. <laughs> they didn't have anything. And uh, they had like kind of something that resembled a, a, a treatment and they had the game. Um, and, uh, and Christoph had some very specific ideas on what he wanted to do with the film. And so it was, uh, it was all about discovering and, and, and I don't know how much you know about Christoph Gans, but he's like the French Quentin Tarantino. He knows everything about cinema I mean, you mentioned that you know I worked in a video store early on, and um, you know you gravitate towards what you love, much like you know uh, you know like how I don't know surfers gravitate towards surf shops or skateboard shops or stuff like that. You know, film geeks at that time, uh, you know, in the '80s and early '90s, gravitated towards video stores because you had a database of I don't know ten thousand titles and this is pre-internet and so it was the only way that you could get your hands on you know the films of Eric Romer and this and that and and be there all day long and I, and I don't know what store you were working at because they were s slave driving you we put movies on all day long and we were like fuck the customers <laughs> no, we, 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 put, we put on the films too but it was uh, it, but with Christoph Quentin just for and the... I would always work together and we would uh, we'd put up he'd put on like you know black exploitation films and I'd be putting on French movies and we would be doing little dissertations and every now and then a customer would would come in and we would just engage them in the conversation and and that was sort of my film school even though I went to film school that was really my uh, film school was just sitting around and just doing film theory and film criticism all day long probably a lot like you yeah well, I mean yeah, that was that's very much anyone who's walked in a suspect video you usually walk into the middle of one of those situations yeah. um, but but Christoph Gans just for some uh, context he's the uh, director of Brotherhood of the Wolf um, and he was also uh, uh, an editor of a, a French kind of science fiction fantasy uh, horror f um, magazine. Uh, we had him in, I did an interview with him when he was, he had a film in Midnight Madness called Crying Freeman, uh, the adaptation of the Japanese manga. And he was one of the first guys that I could talk to about like Shaw Brother films, Hong Kong films. Um, because very much in that day, it was like you'd be trading tapes with people, you'd be writing to people from France to get this stuff. It was yeah. not on the, the click of a button being able to get a lot of this material. So you had to, you had really, if you were a fan of this stuff, you had to actively seek it out. And so Christoph knows everything about, like, every, he does nothing but sit around all day. Like, I'll be in Paris and, you know, if he's not at the Cinematheque, he's at home watching something or playing a game. And he doesn't just, like, you know, flirt with the game for a little bit. He sits down and he plays, you know, a game from beginning to end. He'll spend the 40 to 60 hours needed in one sitting. And and he reads you know novels and books in you know in in, in languages that are not his first language and uh, 
and so he was like a crazy, crazy Silent Hill fan. Like he like loved Silent Hill, and I, I was too. And so I show up, and it became about you know Christoph had some very specific ideas. He had a very specific way he wanted to tell the story and what he wanted to do with the film. And um, when I work uh, for hire, I'm generally uh, you know I, I I consider myself a, a servant of the director. I believe in the director, um, and so. Christoph being my friend and being the director of the film, it was just sort of like trying to figure out what he wanted to do. And he would sometimes say things like to me, like, everyone must have glowing blue eyes. And I'd be like, why? And he's like, they just must. <laughs> and, and so I'd be like, okay, something's going on here. And I'd have to figure out what movies, and I'd have to do a little investigation, and I'd discover there's some obscure movie from the late 60s or something like that where everyone has glowing blue eyes. And so he was like pulling together through a process of uh, less like a cinephile, more like cinephage, where he was uh, pulling together all these different um, ideas together to for what he wanted with Silent Hill, and it was really just trying to <laughs> trying to figure out exactly what he wanted. I mean, it's I, I consider it really Christoph's um, you know Christoph's movie. So. Well, I was actually. Um, I, I can answer that, but I was actually speaking when I talk about a cinematic language or a cinematic grammar, I was actually talking about the physical language of the camera and how the language of the camera must, I think, I believe, evolve from the language of the performance. I could sit here and um, uh, you know, plan the scene of Colin and I sitting here talking on stage. And I could plan it a year in advance and say, okay, I'm gonna cover it like this, or actually I'm gonna cover it from here, and I'm gonna cover it from here, and I'm gonna do a shot of the audience, and, and then you make your shot list, and you, that's your plan. And you show up on set that day, and I don't know, Colin just quit smoking, and he's agitated, and he feels the need to get up and pace and walk around. Um, I, I think it's wrong as a director to tell your actors uh, to, you know, to, to try to force them into doing something that you don't uh, necessarily um, that you don't necessarily something that they don't necessarily feel in in their hearts. If you know, only an actor knows what's going on inside their head and what their motivations are, and I feel like if Colin feels the need to get up and walk around, the camera should get up and walk around with him, and that in doing so, the language of the camera should always evolve from the performance and from what the performance is, uh, um, is doing. Having said that, um, when I speak of a cinematic grammar or a cinematic language, it's, it's entirely about the, uh, the process of montage in, you know, in a Padovkin uh, sense. And um, Padovkin and Eisenstein kind of developed this, these ideas of, um, of how you can use imagery in a certain way to invoke emotion and to convey ideas and how that should all um, stem from the actual dialogues within the film because there is the play that, uh, that occurs and then um, separate from just the play and the, uh, and, and the dialogues of, uh, of Cirque. And I don't, I don't know who the writer was on um, All That Heaven Allows or uh, um, any of the, uh, Cirque's other films. Uh, but Cirque would, you know, cinematically kind of support the performances by uniting or dividing characters with light or objects. You know, he might have a uh, Colin and I talking and have like a curtain kind of in between us or a column or a, have Colin encased in a doorway with red light behind him because he's mad and me on the other side of the room and because I'm calm, there's like a bluish night sky behind me and, you know, he would, uh, he, and, and, more and more as um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk I'm just gonna sidebar just a little briefly and talk about the physiological effects that uh, you know, the differences between film and and video traditional video which is changing now um, film uh, as you know, works on 24 frames a second, and uh, the images are still images that are flashed on screen one after another. And as these images are flashed on the screen, your mind uses the persistence of memory to stitch the images together to create the illusion of motion. It's, it's not actual motion that you're seeing, it's the illusion of motion, it's your eyes that are, uh, and your, your brain that's, that's constructing this. Video works differently, traditional video. Video uses scan lines and refresh rates. 
And um, uh, as you're looking at one image, uh, the scan lines are now replacing uh, the every other um, scan line with uh, you know, the, the next image. And so what you're watching is more refreshing of an image. And in fact, when you go see a movie, um, traditional cinema, your brain is physiologically affected differently than it is with, um, you know, with video. Because your mind is an active participant in creating the motion, whereas in video, it's, you know, the, the refresh rates are just kind of updating constantly. And so when you watch a, a movie, you're actually activating beta cycles in your brain. When you watch television, traditional television, not progressive scan television, but traditional television, it activates alpha cycles in your brain, relaxation cycles, which is why people can veg out for hours and hours and hours on television. Because movies, the process of cinema, you are an active participant in it. Your, your brain is actively participating in, in what you're viewing. And, and so there's two, two different physiological forms. To combat this, commercial directors, uh, you know, from the, especially from the 80s and early 90s, uh, would use techniques to, and music video directors, would use techniques to activate the viewer. Uh, lots of rapid cuts, um, lots of motion within the frame, lots of, you know, fans and doves flying around, and, you know, just anything you can to, you know, to trick the, the viewer into, um, in remain, into remaining engaged and to try to trick the mind from the fact that, you're being, you, that your brain is being affected by alpha cycles. And when these uh, filmmakers who were using this very specific technique to, uh, um, a, a television-based technique, gradually, um, over a generation, uh, became cinema, you know, film you know, making movies that were playing for theaters. They brought their bag of tricks into cinema, and the traditional uh, cinematic grammar uh, that we see less and less of now began to vanish and began to be replaced by, um, for better or worse, the Michael Bay school of uh, <laughs> you know of um, cinema, which you know is all about just constant activation. But in truth, that cinematic style, that style that they developed, that you know, developed over time, uh, it's unnecessary in, in cinema. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, and Michael's a, a friend of mine, I, uh, and, and I think he may be the, the greatest American auteur filmmaker <laughs> there is. However, um, it, 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 it comes at the death of a proper Circean cinematic grammar, which used to be, um, you know, and, and cinema, we can say began, uh, you know, trying to replicate theater and on stage. And early cinema was just looking at a stage. You know, they would back the camera up, and and producers would say, "Why would anybody want to see a piece of someone? You know, why in a close up when they could see the whole thing? You know, and um, you know, and so very gradually over a hundred year period." Uh, Filmmakers began to develop a you know this kind of cinematic grammar that I really truly in my heart deeply respect because you know I I believe it's like a language and it's a language that I think is kind of in some ways being lost. So um, do, does that kind of answer your question? I don't know. I, I'm afraid to say anything to you today. But oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you can say it without a mic. <laughs> I, but you know what? I was actually wondering. I knew that reference you were making, but I was wondering about the, I do want to use my <laughs> I was wondering about the actual artificial dialogue of that period. Uh, that right, the, uh, his actual, you mean like the scenarist's dialogue, the, uh, the writer's, uh, you know, how they spoke, how they spoke. I would I would actually maintain that you know though the dialogue that I tend to write or that, um, you know, that Quentin and I used to write together, actually in its own way is kind of artificial as well. You know, it's, uh, it's a highly stylized form of speaking and thinking. People say things that you kind of normally in life wish you could like, oh, I wish I could have come up with that in the moment. You know, I'm now thinking about it 20 minutes later, you know, and uh, everybody is witty and smart and they, uh, you know, they, uh, you know, and every thought is a cultural reference. And, you know, I, uh, in many ways, we're just as artificial as Douglas Sirk. Um, you know, it's it's not necessarily naturalistic uh, dialogue, and I've never been a naturalist actually as a 
as a as a filmmaker. Um, you know, I'm not. Uh, um, there are filmmakers who are probably far better. I mean, maybe I. Uh, I would maybe not better, but different. Like I don't know. I'm, there's so many uh, filmmakers who are naturalist filmmakers, but like even the mumblecore movement, Joe Swanberg, uh, you know, it, it tries to capture com a completely natural um, uh, presence. And I, I, um, I I'm, I'm strongly attracted to uh, kind of the artifice of cinema. It's actually, I'm, I'm not really a big fan of, of live theater because uh, I miss the cinematic element. And um, because I, 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 in my heart, love cinema. So I don't know. I, again, I don't know if that answers the question, but. <laughs> All right, we've got time for two more questions. You're going to ask. Thanks. Uh, can I ask two quick questions? The first one's fast. <laughs> sure. Um, when you were uh, eating the hors like the hors d'oeuvres in France, yeah. <laughs> did the. <laughs> Did they end up paying for the room that night? Like no, um, actually, there, there were what I would do. <laughs> um, I, literally, I would just uh, I'd eat hors d'oeuvres at a party, and then Monty Hellman, the the filmmaker who directed Tulane Blacktop, and I mean a number of other great movies, a movie I really loved called um, Iguana. Um, <clears throat> he uh, he was a producer on Reservoir Dogs. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I got to know him briefly. And when I was going to Cannes, I basically just cold called everybody I knew. And he was one of the people. And he said, "Hey, you know what? Uh, you you can stay at my place. It's uh, small, but you can sleep on the floor there." And so instead of the hotel, it, yeah, I couldn't afford yeah. a hotel. Yeah, <laughs> I'm too crazy. <laughs> yeah, I definitely couldn't yeah. afford the uh, mm -hmm. the hotel. Yeah. And actually, every now and then there would be some attorney or agent or somebody like that who was kind enough to buy me lunch or right, something. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so second question is, uh, I mean, being 19, like I, I've written a few scripts and I wrote one and I've been like trying to, I talked to Telefilm, to NFB and to Bravo, but no one wants to like collaborate with students, so. No way, nobody wants to do anything. No, they're like, everyone's scared, like, like no one wants to read it, it's like. Don't worry, nobody wants like to talk Satan to me either. Script. Like, nobody wants sucks. to talk to so, me either. <laughs> I feel like it's just keeps, I send this thing away and it comes back. And I feel your pain, I, yeah, I, same brutal. thing happens to me. Listen, it doesn't matter if you have an Academy Award and a BAFTA and almost every writing award, you mm -hmm. know, in, in creation, they don't care. <laughs> no. <laughs> that doesn't matter. Um, a little advice to you and actually to everybody, no one will ever give you anything. You have to take it. Mm -hmm. um, there's, uh, you know, forget two cents, 200,000, 2 million, 20 million, whatever the number is, it's scalable. No one wants to give it to you. Right. You have to go in there and you're going to make it with or without them. Yeah. I mean, you just have to, and you have to forget telefilm. Um, mm -hmm. Telefilm, yeah, I mean... They're really like Canada. Canada is email. Canada is fantastic, and I and I love telefilm, but you you just have to you have to these days. It's not a, if you have to make your movie with your iPhone, or yeah. or, or your Android or whatever uh, yeah. <laughs> phone you have. You know, if you have to, that's how you have to make your film. I'm just worried it's, that it's gonna like suck when I make it, and then. I'm like, oh man, like I just. Well, this is another uh, little bit of advice to you. Yeah. You all, will always cry yeah. <laughs> on the first cut of yeah. your film. At least I do. And then you know, you, but it, it it's like a, you have to like. Um, you have to, like my baby, and I'm like, I don't want to ruin it, and then with a like a thirty dollar budget, and then. But. Well. You know, um, is it worth then? Mm. Then just know that you're going to be a father of many children. Yeah, <laughs> and that you know some of them are going to be more fortunate with mm -hmm. their funding than others, <laughs> and um, you just have to be willing to. I mean, if if you have one that listen, the way both Reservoir Dogs and Killing Zoe came mm -hmm. about was um, Quentin and I were we'd been trying to get stuff going for a long time trying to get movies made, and we were encountering the same thing. And we didn't really have the kind of tools that are available now. I mean, we did a movie called My Best Friend's Birthday yeah, at one so. point. And, you know, we shot that on, on, you know, not on negative stock, but on reversal film, right. which is like, you know, the positive. We shot it on, you should never do it. We were using that as our negative because we couldn't afford to do it any other way. Mm -hmm. And it was the only way that I could think of to make it work in the budget. And the movie looks, 
and I shot the film and it looks like shit. <laughs> and, um, but that was just because it, at that point it was just, we wanted it so bad we were willing to do it any way we could. But that was the start, right? That so, was the start. Yeah, and yeah. then, and we never really even, Quentin never really finished that movie. We never got the finishing funds for mm -hmm. it. But we we sat around, we, we started thinking, well, what can we do? Like, how can we get a film made? And so we, Quentin and I thought, okay, so we'll get, it's easier to make a short film mm -hmm. than a long film. We knew that. So we thought, so if we get a bunch of filmmakers together, we can all make similar films and we can put them together like an anthology. And so that's how we came up with Pulp Fiction. <gasps> we were like, oh, we'll, we'll do a whole bunch of short stories and each of us will direct one. And I wrote the gold watch sequence mm -hmm. and Quentin <clears throat> wrote, uh, you know, his, his sequences. And, and we actually, there was a, another filmmaker named Adam Rifkin who was much more advanced than either of us. And he was supposed to direct the third sequence and he never wrote his mm -hmm. sequence. And to this day, he's like, man, I could have been involved in Pulp Fiction. God, wow. now I'm not. And, uh, <laughs> and, um, and so we, uh, we wrote those out. And we, we had our two stories that we had written, and Adam never wrote his. And then we ended up just expanding it. But our, what we told ourselves, we gave ourselves rules. And the rules were thus. And this is probably like a nightmare to you because we were just talking about last night how you end up with all these movies that are a guy trapped in a trunk of a car, a guy trapped in a coffin, a guy trapped in an elevator. You know, it's like it's always somebody trapped mm -hmm. in a confined location. But the fact of the matter is when you're working on a budget or, or when you're working with nothing, the trick was keep the locations to a minimum, keep the talent to a minimum, and, you know, write it like a stage play. Right. Um, we also thought that every single scene should stand on its own in an acting class. Like right. you should be able to take a scene out of the script and it should be able like to exist its own on its own. Yeah. It should be like a completely fully submersible module. And in fact, I look at movies like six submersible, six to eight submersible modules that can each independently live on their own. And all that matters is that something be interesting. Right. You know, that uh, if you watch R Rules of Attraction from beginning to end, you'll see that it's a very um, almost fragmented film. It's like a, a series of vignettes that are all kind of just mm -hmm. assembled together. And this was, uh, um, I mean, this was by choice. I, I, I'm not a big fan of um, establishing shots. Yeah. Uh, I just like to drop into a scene. I want it to play like, uh, you know, like, you know, like as in an acting class we would try to keep the characters to a minimum. And that's how Reservoir Dogs came about. And, um, you know, Reservoir Dogs began as a short film and it ended up expanding it into a feature. All of the flashback sequences with Tim Roth were added uh, to, to make it feature length. And, um, and we were inspired actually by Martin Scorsese, whose film, uh, I think it was Who's That Knocking at My Door? Is that the one? Is that the one? No, wait. Yeah. Which, or was it, Alice doesn't live here anymore. Uh, yeah, Alice doesn't live here anymore. Sorry. I'm, uh, he, um, he, uh, he started off as a short film and then he expanded it into a feature just by adding footage. And that's how Reservoir Dogs came so about. So it was a, a short first? Yeah, it began as a short. And, you know, in fact, most of, the, most of the stuff in Pulp Fiction, after I had written, in fact, it was a piece of Pulp Fiction originally. It was oh, yeah. Quentin's story, and he expanded it to become that. That's why the diamonds are in the mm -hmm. briefcase in Pulp Fiction. They, those, that's the brief, well, it's not really diamonds. And you wrote the gold watch thing? Yeah. Did you write it for Christopher Walken, or was that just... No, no, no? we were, I was delighted that Christopher Walken yeah. was in it, though. Yeah, it I'd neat. never met anybody who was a vampire, and you meet yeah. him. It's like, my God, I just met a vampire. <laughs> oh, I love Christopher yeah, Walken. Yeah, he's sweet. <laughs> Thanks, appreciate yeah. it. Sure, sure. All right, one more to wrap it up. Um, I kind of, plan okay, someone's, yep, over here. Um, a, thank you for revealing what was in the briefcase. That's bothered me ever since I saw that yeah. film. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, just uh, as a quick sidebar, before he asks his question, the the whole idea about the uh, the briefcase originally we knew that there were diamonds in it originally it was from a diamond heist that's what it was we when we were working on the script it didn't seem like it was enough for the stakes at hand and so we started talking about it well what should be in the briefcase you know maybe it should be gold and maybe it's this and maybe it's that and eventually we thought you know I, I kind of had the idea of well let's just not show it 
it's like the shark in Jaws. Like the less you see, the better it is. And the the best things in movies are what you don't see. It's really what you don't see that affects you, because your mind will create something infinitely better than anything that you know I can come up with. And um, and so by not showing it, it was just a you know it was just a way to um, to let everybody else kind of fill in um, what's really special to you. But it was diamonds. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, my actual question was, um, how did you feel about um, surrendering the writing credit and just taking a story's credit and uh, allowing that to go like become a sort of written and directed by Quentin Tarantino film? Well, just understand, Quentin and I are were best friends, and like like most people here, you guys, uh, you know, you're you're there's a kind of fantastic freedom you have with your friends right now that there's no agents or producers or attorneys or publicity or any of that crap that has very little to do with the actual, you know, craft of making films, you know, that it, that's all part of professional filmmaking. Many of you, I mean, and maybe not all of you, but m many of you are, uh, you're at a fantastic place where you can completely collaborate with your friends on on everything. And at that time, Quentin and I, we collaborated on everything. I mean, there's I wrote scenes as favors for Natural Born Killers. He would come to me and he's like, oh my God, I've got to write this scene because we have these two financiers who are bodybuilders and they they're they they want they just want to be in the movie. I can't bring myself to write the scene. Would you please do it for me, Roger? And so I would write the scene, and thank God the scene didn't end up in the movie. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's a really good scene. It's one of the best scenes I've ever written. But I, I should say, thank God the bodybuilders didn't end up in, in the movie. Actually, Oliver Stone talks about how that was the scene that made him want to do the movie, and that he fucked it up. He was like, yeah, I fucked it up, and <laughs> he shot it badly. But it, it's actually kind of a. I'm, Anyhow, it's uh, when you when you're young and you and you're free from the, uh, the formalities of the process. You're you're kind of in this liberated state where you can completely share your brain with other people. It gets a little different when suddenly you're uh, um, suddenly all the trappings come in all you know there's money and there's producers and agents and and, and everything gets a little different and uh, the truth is I, I I Quentin and I shared so much I mean I would never have been able to make my first film without Quentin and I was actually in post-production on my film when he called me and asked me if he could alter the credits contractually from because uh, we had written that like before, I mean, it was kind of much of it was written before Reservoir Dogs and before everything, you know, all, all the stuff that was in there was written at this other time in our life. And he just called me up and he's like, you know what, I'd, I'd really like the credits to read this way. And, you know, I just said, sure, yeah, go for it. It's, uh, I was in the middle of post production on my, on my film. And, uh, you know, I, I would at the time give Quentin anything he asked for. You know, it's uh, just like you would with any friend. And so um, I'm grateful to have been part of the process. I mean, if the question is, <clears throat> am I bitter at all about not having uh, you know, a written by credit and just stories by, we looked at that like it was a book. You know, Pulp Fiction to us was like a novel. And, um, and we weren't in the Writers Guild, and so there was no no one telling us, so you have to have writer's credit. Like, in fact, in Rules of Attraction in the credits, I originally wanted Brett and I to share the writing credit and have it say, you know, and Brett wanted it also, and we both wanted it. And we went to the Writers Guild and we asked them if we could have the credits read a certain way, and they said, no, you may not. The credits have to read like this. Because I just wanted it to be directed by Roger Avery and then have the writing credit separate, and I wanted actually Brett's credit to be larger. I felt like I had just served the, the writer of the book in adapting the, uh, the material. And the Writers Guild said, absolutely not. And, and I said, but I'm the writer. I'm asking for this. And they said, we don't care. And this is, uh, you have to do it this way. You have to have your credits read a certain way. And I hate that. And fortunately, Pulp Fiction came at a time before uh, we were in the Writers Guild. It was actually the only award we didn't win was the Writers Guild of America Award. Um, 
it was the only writing award because we didn't qualify. I think four weddings and a funeral. Um, uh, I think that was the one that won <laughs> the best screenplay that year. So, um, so the the answer is, I you know, I I bought my house off Pulp Fiction. I uh, you know, my best friend made the movie. I uh, you know, I, I I love him like a brother, and I'm, you know, I would give him anything except for my daughter <laughs> here somewhere, as I've mentioned before. So. Thank you. Anyhow, that's it. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Let's hear it. Thank Rock you. Bravery. And. <clears throat> By the way, I know that everybody is like, uh, you know, you guys are all students and you've um, from all over the place. And I, I really appreciate uh, coming out here and, uh, you know, on your own dime, you know, uh, showing up here at the TIFF to uh, to talk with me. I, 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 I hope, you know, I, I hope I can uh, convey, <laughs> you know, uh, anything about the process of making movies. But the one thing that I would want to get across to anybody in this room is that it's anybody. There, there, there is, like I said, there is no degree to, uh, you know, that you need to have to practice film. It's all about just picking up a camera and doing it. And the, uh, the tools are out there right now. I mean, it's... Uh, there's a, a camera, three thousand dollar a camera, the Black Magic camera coming out now. I mean, that is a fantastic. It's the equivalent of a sixteen millimeter camera, and it's a fantastic uh, device. And even that is ridiculously expensive. But you know, the the tools are there to just pick up a camera and make a movie, and anybody can do it. It's just you know, it, it's. It's just a craft. All you have to have is the will to do it. And it's not about money. It's about the will to do it. Just the sheer force of mighty willpower making it happen. And that's all you have to do is just will it into being. That's the, that's the trick. So, so go out and make movies. Thanks. Thanks.